Brilliant. Thank you, Vincent, for the very lovely introduction. And, and welcome, everyone. Really, really great that you've all joined this morning. And I'm delighted to be talking to you about how do we make a splash? So how do we link sustainability, purpose, lean and storytelling? And what I'm going to offer you today is some tools and some ways of working that can really help you to look at some of the the wicked problems that we have got. And within higher education, we're all part of this. One of our roles, whether we are part of professional services or academics, or as Vincent and I are pracademics, is, is thinking about how do we inspire the, the future leaders that we have, but also how do we inspire our institutions to work in this way? So I'm really delighted that you've joined. So thank you very much for, for getting up early or late, wherever you are. So this is what I'm going to cover in the next hour, and I make no apologies for trying to pack in as much as I possibly can, because really we have a huge job on our hands as lean practitioners, but as also as pracademics, we have to really think about how we get people within the sweet spot so they're in flow, so they're not scared, they're not bored, but they can actually do really good purposeful work. So when I was reflecting on Lean and the journey that we've all had together as Lean HE, it's been really inspiring over the last decade that we've all grown together. We're a community of practice. We share ideas. We have open, respectful discussions and we all learn from each other. I've really enjoyed the last two days. I've learned so much already and I'm looking forward to learning more today as well. So what we're going to talk about here is, is what is purpose, sustainability, lean and storytelling, as it's always good to start off with some definitions and also explore why we should link them. We'll think about how we can use these ideas in our lean practice, but also how do we embed these ideas within our institutions? And this is where I invite you to be the social maverick within your institutions. It's really important that we speak truth to power and that we do as much as we can with the agency that we've got to, to really change our mindsets and change our ways of working. I'll share with you a couple of tools and a toolkit that I use to do this. And I would love that we share our own experiences, our challenges and our joys. So please use the meeting chat to pose questions, but also when I pose you a question, if you could please also include those in the chat, that would be great. So what you can see on the left here is the tree of life, which is something that I've developed over the years using Adcar, which some of you will be familiar with, of how we have a positive future. And I think that's really important that we use our agency to do that, to enact that. So this is a little bit about storytelling. So to make sense of something new, it's always good to start with a story. So here is the story of a neighborhood nursing in the Netherlands and of a pioneering organization called Burgsorg. Since at least the 18th century, every neighborhood in the Netherlands has had one or more nurses that worked outside of hospitals, visiting the sick and the elderly in their homes. During the 20th century, the social security system increasingly took over the cost of the system. In the 1980s, the Dutch government had an idea that made a lot of sense. Seen from an orange scientific industrial perspective, if all the nurses could be grouped into large organizations, economies of scale would kick in, generating savings for the taxpayer. Nurses were pushed to affiliate with large organizations that started implementing modern, here we're calling this orange, management practices step by step. Quickly, these organizations decided it was inefficient that the client would always be seen by the same nurse. A different nurse was now dispatched to clients every day based on availability. Higher flexibility meant less potential downtime for nurses between two clients. Call centers were set up in headquarters. Now that clients could no longer call their nurse directly. Then it was decided to have the nurses specialize. More experienced nurses would be paid more. So they were sent to do only the more difficult technical interventions. All the rest, simpler things like shots and bandages was now pushed to less expensive nurses, resulting in further cost savings. Step by step, the orange machine logic took over. Managers noticed that some nurses worked much faster than others, so time norms were established. Two and a half minutes to change a compression stocking, 10 minutes for a shot. Everything was specified down to the minute with time norms defined. Planning departments were set up in headquarters. Every evening, each nurse now receives a sheet of paper with a detailed plan for the next day. Prepared by someone in the planning department, she or he most likely will never meet. And predictably, these corporations started merging. 
The care providers started emerging in pursuit of further economies of scale to manage the nurses in these big companies. Layers of hierarchy were added. A district manager overseeing a few dozen nurses reports to a regional manager who reports to a national manager. The managers today often have no nursing experience. Their role is to simply monitor and improve the nurses' performance. They have lots of data. They can slice and dice because nurses are asked to peg a small barcode sticker to the front door of all clients, scan that code when they go in and scan it when they leave. With all this data, managers can make continuous improvement. They can tell nurses for which kind of interventions they are slower than their peers. Every one of these changes, specialization, flexibility, economies of scale, continuous improvement has resulted in efficiency gains, arguably a good thing for the Dutch healthcare system. But there is a dark side to the system. Patients hate it. For older, sometimes confused clients, having an unknown face come into the intimacy of their home every day is difficult. They have to share their story and their medical condition with a total and hurried stranger. Nurses hate it. The way they are asked to operate hurts their vocational integrity. They realise that they often give bad or insufficient care, but the system prevents them from doing what they know is called for. So change was needed. So what happened in 2006? A nurse named Jean de Bloch had been working as a nurse for 10 years and experienced firsthand the changes forced into his profession. Disgusted, he quit his job and created Virtual. It would operate efficiently and entirely differently. Quickly, he found that a self-organizing team of 10 to 12 nurses with no manager and no team leader was perfect to provide great care and a great workplace. So this gave us a whole different perspective on healthcare. Care at its best is a small miracle that happens or not in the relationship of the patient and the nurse. That miracle never shows up when a mechanical perspective is applied to care. The best care will happen, De Block is convinced, when nurses are seen as professionals and when they're trusted. Give them freedom and they will offer truly great care. The first thing a nurse does, from Bertzorg does, with a new patient is to sit down and drink coffee. Nurses often assist the patients in creating a network of support to feel less alone and less dependent. For instance, they often help older patients and their children learn how to be there for one another during illnesses. So Bertzorg has become a spectacular success story. Patients love it, nurses love it. So much that nurses have been deserting traditional nursing companies in droves. So the stories that I have told you here is, is really important. And this actually comes from a book that some of you may have come across. And it is called... Sorry, I'm just <laughs> scrolling up. Reinventing Organisations. So some of you may have come across this. It was written by a guy called Frederick Leloup, and this is included in our references at the end of the presentation. So why did I tell you that story? It's always really good to set things into context. So when we start to think about purpose and linking this to lean, what is true north? So when we're thinking about the, the nursing setup in the Netherlands, what were we actually trying to achieve with that? So what was setting the direction for change? It might be that the results are, are more efficient, but are they more effective? And I think that's something that we really need to be aware of when we're working in this way. So direct, setting the direction for change. What is true north? So we're within the higher education space. And I know values-led higher education is really important. We want to inspire our students. We want them to provide them with the knowledge, the tools, the all of the things that they need to be able to draw on in this absolutely crazy world that we are living in at the moment. So if we think about True North and we want to have a values-led higher education system that meets the needs for all of our stakeholders, for ourselves as academics and practitioners and students and parents, it's really important and also for wider society that we honour that and that we look at how everyone can flourish. So the people you can see on your screen now are Greta Thunberg and this wonderful gentleman, David Attenborough, who has really inspired a huge generation of people to set their true north in the direction of sustainability. We know we have COP26 that is happening in Glasgow in a couple of weeks time. And this is a really important moment where we're asking all of us to reassess what our true north is and to reassess how are we going to live? How are we going to flourish um, locally, but also internationally? So I want you to just think about this. What if 
we had true equality. We valued ourselves, each other, and the planet in equal measure. What if we had an approach to business and lean that ensures we can thrive locally and globally within our organizations, within our teams? What if sustainability and lean in all of its forms was at the heart of the public and the private debate? So what I'd like you to do is close your eyes and get into your time machine. So I'm gonna count down from 10 to one and you are going to wake up in the year 2030. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You wake up in the year 2030. What if all the above has come true? How does it feel? What does it look like? Using all your senses, look around you and think, oh my goodness, this is amazing. We're all flourishing. We're all living our best life. We're all using all of these tools as lean practitioners and lean academics to really look at how we can reduce waste in every, everywhere that we look. So I'm gonna snap my fingers. We're back in 2021. What should we start doing? What should we stop doing and what should we keep? The future is ours and we have major decisions to make. So we can do it, we must do it. This is what environmental, social and financial sustainability is all about. So join us on this journey. We're all in this together. So what future will we choose? So what I'd like to do now is just introduce you to the circular economy. And this is something that has been developed by a huge number of people. But the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, based very close to us here in Southampton on the Isle of Wight, have been pioneers, have been vanguards of this. So just sit back and enjoy, I don't know if enjoy is the right word, this short clip, which is talking about how we can reimagine our cities with circularity in mind. And our universities are part of our cities. So this is where we want to design out waste, keep products in use and regenerate natural systems. By 2050, two thirds of us will live in cities. Already, cities are where we consume 75% of our natural resources, produce over 50% of global waste, and emit up to 80% of global greenhouse gases. These are consequences of our linear take-make-waste model. But cities are also places which concentrate on innovation, education, finance, culture, and where people exchange ideas. Pragmatic and acting quickly, they play a leading role in politics and the economy. They can lead the way to develop a circular economy. The circular economy can help cities to thrive and become more livable and resilient, helping to meet urban priorities around housing, transport and economic development. The circular economy can also help cities meet the sustainable development goals and their climate targets. It starts with three principles. Design out waste and pollution. Avoid creating waste in the first place. For example, with products and parts created within cities when needed, using materials that can be reused, recycled or composted. Making use of untapped space in buildings, transport and using renewable energy to power the city, making them healthier and cleaner. Keep products in use. So products are no longer used just once. They're reused, repaired and refurbished. And people gain access to the things they need, be it space, products or transport, in new ways. For example, through sharing rather than owning and connecting people to their neighbours and communities. And cities are planned so that materials flow. Regenerate natural systems so that valuable nutrients return to the soil and air and water quality improves in the city and in the countryside beyond. Ready to get started? Check out the resources from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Circular Economy in Cities is a suite of online resources which provide a reference point for urban policymakers. It will help you understand what the implementation of circular economy principles in cities can look like with fact sheets on the opportunities and benefits that a circular economy can bring to cities, guidance on which levers can be used to accelerate this transition, case studies from cities that have already been putting these ideas into practice, and links to other networks and resources to learn what other organisations are doing on the topic of circular economy in cities. 
If you're ready to take things further, you can join networks of cities, businesses and institutions all collaborating on the circular economy. Search for a circular economy in cities or visit ellenmacarthurfoundation.org. So I hope you found that really inspiring. The work that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation are doing is brilliant. Um, I don't know if any of you sail, but Ellen MacArthur is very well known as a, a sailor who circumnavigated the globe. And this had a huge transformative feeling for her that she needed to do something. So when we start to talk about sustainability, we can weave this into our work as lean practitioners. And we can use something called the triple bottom line that Elkington developed quite a long time ago now, where we put at the heart of what we're doing, people, planet and profit. We need to ensure that we have respect for people at the heart of what we're doing. We need to ensure that people can flourish in their own environments, in their own places. And this links in beautifully with the philosophy and the actions of Lean. We need to look after our planet. If you think about our planet, we are on a rock hurtling through space at you know a, a huge velocity but actually we are on a beautiful world we need to look after her we also need to think about that actually we're still in a reasonably benign climate and we have time to limit global warming to two degrees or 1.5 degrees and we also do need to think about profit we need to think about the lifeblood of organizations and how we ensure that these organizations can survive and thrive in their places. I just wanna draw your attention to this. This, is, this comes from our common future, which was the Brundtland Report that was published in 1987. So I was 17 in 1987, and we've had a lot of time to do this, to enact change, to hone our skills, to really bring about improvements. And this is the, the definition for sustainable development. It's the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And I'd just like you all to reflect on that for a moment. So when you're making decisions in your institutions, whether they're structural decisions or day-to-day -day decisions, think about not just you, not just this generation, but take on board the wisdom of the 13 indigenous grandmothers we need to think about the next seven generations. And that can feel huge, that can feel really quite difficult, but that is what we need to do. We need to think about not just the here and now, our decisions that we make today are going to impact the next seven generations. So again, I have included the Brundtland Report as part of the references, and, and please read it. The, even if you read the first three or four pages, it really makes you sit up and think. In 2015, in December 2015, the UN published their 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm hoping that you can see that this really has a lot of resonance with the work that we do as lean practitioners. So there are 17 goals in total, but behind those goals, we have five or six objectives and measures. So you can start to see that we are holding our governments to account around the UN SDGs. Some countries are doing this a lot better than others. And there are again, loads of resources that we can weave into our practice as academics or professional services. If we're thinking about people, planet and profit, we can think about how do the UN SDGs support the idea that we need to flourish, that we need to flourish between planetary boundaries and social foundations. So this is where we're linking social justice and climate justice with the work that we do as lean practitioners. We have our biosphere, we have our society and we have our economy. And you can see where all of the different UN SDGs fit with that. I'd also like you to think about how you make sense of this. And if you have a look at this spiral now, I think this shows beautifully how if we're at the center, we are part of this wonderful system. And I know a lot of you and as lean practitioners have systems thinking at the heart of what we do. We look at process, we look at inputs, we look at transformation, we look at what is value added, we look at the outputs, and then we look at the feedback mechanisms and we look at cycles. 
we look at cycles of change, whether it's continuous improvement or whether it is transformative change. And when we start to think about this visually, that then brings together all of our senses to make sense of really complex, messy systems. We're all part of human activity systems, and we know that working within teams can be joyful, can be challenging, can be really quite tricky. But if we think about what are we trying to achieve, have a vision, have a vision. Your, what is your true north? What is your purpose? And how can you then enact that vision? So just bringing our perspective back to Lean and thinking about how we link all of this stuff around the circular economy to our work as Lean practitioners. At the basis of this, we have our respect for people, which is so important. How do we talk to people? How do we honor them? How do we honor their perspectives? If we have people within our team, it's important that we have a really diverse team. So for example, within my MSc for project management at the moment, I have 35 amazing students from all the way around the world who are learning together, who are working together, who are challenging each other. But we all do that with the underpinning respect for each other and respect for other people's ideas. We also need to look at the eradication of waste in whatever form we find it. So when we're working as lean practitioners, we look at what's value added, we look at what's business value added, and we look at what is non-value added. So we could think about when we're designing our products and our services, how can we ensure that we minimize waste or how can we eradicate waste? How can we ensure that if there is any waste at the end of our processes, we can then feed that back as part of the circular economy into either the biological system or the technical system. And we also can think about how do we engender this, this hugely important way of working of continuous improvement. So not becoming mechanistic, not becoming just focused on the figures because we need to have people at the heart of what we're doing, but how can we really give people the tools and the time and the space and the resources to work and live in this way. So one thing that I'd like you to just consider is how do you weave lean and sustainability within your own institutions? So if you'd like to just add into the meeting chat, what do you currently do? I'd be really, really interested to have a look at some of your own experiences. So if you can just add into the meeting chat, how do you weave lean and sustainability within your institution? Are you part of the Green Gown Awards, for example, or the EAUC? How do you embed the idea of being able to flourish individually as teams, as programs, as professional services within an organization and within our HE institutions? So how do you weave lean and sustainability within your institution? So I'm going to give you two minutes to think about that and then please add that to the meeting chat. So your two minute sprint starts now. How do you weave lean and sustainability within your institution? How do your senior leadership teams, your vice chancellors, your, your provosts, how do, they, how do they engender the behaviours and the values that we need to show that lean and green are intertwined? So you've got just over a minute and a half to go. How do you weave lean and sustainability within your institution? Brilliant, so if you'd like to just add to the meeting chat, you've got one minute to go. How do you weave sustainability? Sorry, I can't type and talk at the same time. <laughs> Into your organization. And if you don't, think about how you could. So you've got about 40 seconds to go. <laughs> So how do you weave sustainability and lean into your, oh, great stuff, thank you. We've got a few things coming through now. You collect questions at the end. Oh, thank you, you're collecting questions at the end. Thanks, Vincent. So you're introducing, starting to think about sustainable objectives. Brilliant, thank you, David. Remembering that waste isn't just in process terms. Thanks, Tom, great stuff. 
So if you'd like to add to the meeting chat as we go through, that would be really great to see so we can share each other's ideas um, and see how we can enact that. So how do we motivate influence and, and really get people on board to help us to achieve certain goals? So one of the things that I'm really struck by is how we can use stories and how we can use storytelling to really help us to do that. So I'd like you to think about the, the childhood story that you always go back to when you're feeling like you need a bit of inspiration. And I love the keynote at the beginning of our conference where we were talking a little bit about the hungry caterpillar or the tiger that came to tea. Those are some of the stories that I absolutely adore and I still have. So my children are now 18 and 15, but I'm still gonna keep those books. Another story that I really like is, is one from Sweden, which is uh, Pippi Longstocking. And one of the things that I always link Pippi Longstocking to is Belvin and I come out as a thing finder, a, a resource investigator. So I'm able to find stuff, find information, find people to be able to bring to a team to do good things. And, and those stories are really important. So Pippi Longstocking was a thing finder. And essentially a story expresses how and why life changes. Stories are how we remember. We tend to forget lists and bullet points, or, or some people work really well with lists and bullet points. I tend to be a mind map gal, but if we have stories, really, really important stories that touch us, that touch our hearts, that touch our fears, the storyteller discovers a story by asking key questions and self-knowledge is at the root of all great storytelling. So think about the stories that you tell. Think about the stories that you open with at the beginning of your, your workshops, or think about the stories that you tell as part of your day-to-day your -day life. So when we think about storytelling, and this draws me back to the key themes of this conference, that we want to collaborate, we want to innovate, and we want to celebrate. Now, storytelling is a really good way of doing that. Storytelling is the essential human activity. The harder the situation, the more essential it is. And if you just think back to 2020, we have had a really, really difficult time globally. We've been in the middle of a pandemic. We've been in the middle of COVID-19 and we're still living it. If you see the stories of what's happening in the UK, it's truly frightening. 51,000 cases a day at the moment. And, and this is part of our story. So when I was doing some research for this, this workshop, I, I found this article from the New York Times and it was talking about the key words of the year 2020. So things like bubbles, things like circuit breakers, social distancing, flatten the curve, Zoom. <laughs> so we're on a Zoom call now. How many of you were using Zoom before the pandemic hit? A virtual happy hour. Black Lives Matter, contact tracing, wildfires. So all of these things are part of our story. How are you gonna tell this story to your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren in 10 years time? What are you gonna take for it? So when we're making a splash, when we want to create some change, when we want to drop our pebble into the, the puddle of our organizations and let everything ripple out, we need to think about how we're telling our story. So I did a storytelling course last year with a great guy called Chris Smith who runs storytelling schools. And when we are developing our stories, when we're writing our stories, we need to think about who are our heroes, our monsters, our heroines? How can we weave magic into what we are doing? What is, what is our hope and our wonder? How do we talk about death and despair? So great stories need these things. They need a mood that moves us. They need openings that hook, that make you sit up, that make you think, oh, this is interesting. I wonder how it's gonna end. You need to have settings that convince, characters that we care about, problems that matter, middles that build drama, endings that are satisfying, action that's clear and descriptions that are vivid. We need to think about what is the problem that we're trying to solve or tell with this story. So when you're crafting your stories, this is um, something that you can have within your toolbox. And again, this is from Chris Smith and his storytelling schools. So you need to be aware of where. Where is the place that your story is, is embedded? 
So when I was telling you the story at the beginning of this workshop, we were in Holland, in the Netherlands. I have great love for the Netherlands. I, I grew up there. I lived there for 10 years and it's part of my DNA. We also need to think about who. So we were talking about nurses and patients and managers. We were talking about what? So the healthcare system and how nurses enact what they're doing within the Dutch healthcare and social systems. We needed to think about the obstacles. So the obstacles was how do we ensure that we were efficient at the beginning? So how did we set up our system within that healthcare service to, to really actually think about our true north? Why were we doing this? Then we needed to think about, well, what were the setback? And patients were really unhappy with the system. Nurses were really unhappy with the system. It had become too mechanistic. So then we started to think about the nurse who took on this. Who was the helper? And what was the solution that he came up with? So the ending, really important. He gave empathy and a huge amount of agency back to the nurses, but also back to the families and the patients. So thinking about the ending, the satisfying ending that this company that he set up, this way of working, totally transformed how nurses worked and how their patients received their care. So then we can think about the learning at the end of that story. What do we take from that? So when you're weaving this into your work as lead practitioners, where are you citing this? Who's involved? What are you doing? What are the obstacles that you're facing? What is the setback that you come across? Because we all have setbacks all the time. Who is helping? What is the solution that you come up with? How does it end? And what learning do you take from it? So what I'd like you to think about now, just to put this into the meeting chat, is how do you share your lean stories within your institution? So again, I'm going to give you two minutes to think about this. How do you share your lean stories in your institution? What do you do? How do you share the joys? How do you share the pain? How do you share the challenges? How do you share good practice? So we do this within our Lean HE community of practice. And what we're doing this right now, we're sharing our stories, which is absolutely brilliant. And I love being part of this community. It's so, so important. So you've got a minute and a half. How do you share your lean stories in your institutions? So what stories do you tell and how do you tell them? How do you share your lean stories in your institutions? You've got one minute to go in this short sprint. <laughs> So thanks, Dave. Case studies through an improvement network and staff award. Brilliant. What else? What else does everyone do? Community of practice, case studies, presentations. Thank you, Benita. Communication within teams. Brilliant. How do you share your lean stories? So via your BACOP and your CICOP, plus colleagues over coffee. Brilliant. You've got a community of practice that meet once a month over lunch. Brilliant, yes. So I'd really urge you to um, join Suzanne's um, <laughs> workshop talking about some work that we've done with um, ODHE. So celebrating lean successes. Um, we get people who've been there to ask them to tell their story from their perspective. Brilliant. So it's really great. You're already starting to weave stories around lean. Great, so we've got 10 seconds to go if anybody would like to share. So thank you, Caroline. You celebrate your lean successes within your Champions Network. Really important. I'm a great believer in celebrations. <laughs> so then how do we link sustainability, purpose, lean and storytelling? How do we make our splash? So one of the things that we can draw on is, is something called flow. So getting our colleagues and our students to experience flow, which is when they're working at their optimum, fully engaged, absorbed, not over or understimulated, not bored and not scared. And we find a lot of sports men and women get into flow when they are working at their best. So flow is defined by a six end Mahali as being completely involved in an activity for its own sake. The ego falls away. So I hope I pronounced this guy's name 
properly. If I haven't, then please let me know. <laughs> I need to practice. So one way to make a splash is to use artifacts. And one of the artifacts I use in my workshops is Lego. So Lego serious play is something that I have a huge amount of respect for. It's a way of constructing models. It's a way of constructing process. It's a way of constructing how we see our organizations. And when we're constructing a model, we might not actually know what that model means to us until we use metaphors and we tell the story of our model. So we draw on fantasy and imagination to explain the landscape, to talk about the connections, to talk about real-time emergence, and to then construct our simple guiding principles. So for any of you who are thinking about becoming Lego Series Play practitioners, go for it. It is amazing. It's transformative on a personal level, and it's transformative when we're working within our institutions. So this has been described as multidimensional, complex, adaptive knowledge systems done by social construction. A mouthful, I know, but it's really transformative. When you're drawing, you are downloading your thoughts in 2D. When you're building models, you are downloading your thoughts in 3D. And then when you tell the story, you're adding more dimensions. We hold a lot of knowledge in our bodies. So when we are physically developing models, physically drawing models, physically working, with our post-it notes. All of these things are really important. We are embodying that knowledge, we're transferring that knowledge, and we do that also by telling the story of the model. So linking this back to flow, flow is commitment to a process that is enjoyed. So we could be preoccupied, we're just so focused that we don't realise that three hours have gone by. I still play um, Candy Crush and those types of things on my phone. I'm trying to get over that because I know not the greatest use of my time, but actually I'm in flow. <laughs> so we need to think about optimal stretch. How do we challenge? How do we bring differentiation and integration into our purpose, into our true north? So for all of you who like to understand a bit around the theory, we can link this to constructivism and Piaget is the reference for that. Constructionism, Charles and Pape flow, complex adaptive systems and autopoetic organizational epistemology. So some great <laughs> references there for you to have a look at. So this is where we can bring in the idea of play with purpose. Colleagues and students may be bored, scared, turned off by the spectre of global warming and all of these other things, wicked issues that we need to look at. They might be feeling disenfranchised and at a loss about how to um, tackle these issues. So a possible solution is Lego Serious Play. Other solutions are to use any other artifacts you've got in your, um, your space. So this is an example of a Lego Serious Play workshop that I held with some students in Cardiff. And we were looking at how we could weave sustainability into their program. So what you can see here is my kit, <laughs> my landscape kit and my connections kit. And what you can see here is that they have started to really tackle that problem from different perspectives. So thinking about here, how are they going to, to share the importance of communicating around global warming and around sustainability? So they were saying, using this as a story, that they have various toolkits that are available to them and they want to inspire people. But sometimes people don't know what that story is until they have to tell it. So what we can do here is bring all of our, our being, our agency, our tools and our senses to this work. And one way to use other models within, within this space is something called ADCAR, which is from ProSci. So ProSci are an American research institution and a lot of the work that they do around change management is really, really important, is really transformative. So ADCAR stands for Awareness, Desire, Knowledge, Ability and Reinforcement. So thinking about how we can make a splash. <clears throat> we can raise awareness through stories, by things like the Carbon Literacy Project, by transformation and improvement championed by our senior leaders, having sustainability champions and lean champions, linking COP26 and the UN SDGs. The desire how do we make a difference? How do we improve our current state? So what is our current state? What do we need to do to move to our future state? So in 2030, that we're all flourishing. 
So the knowledge that we can draw on, Lean HG as a community of practice, the UN Global Compact and Sully Test is something that I really recommend if you don't have this within your institutions. Climate change modules available to everyone, Lean Six Sigma modules available to everyone. And then the ability, how do we get into flow? How do we develop our sustainability and our lean innovation projects? How do we develop our communities of practice working as lean at a foundation level and at a practitioner level? And then how do we reinforce this by joining organizations like Lean HE, EAUC, Climate Action, the Tree of Life, ensuring that we're flourishing, embedding the circular economy into our institutions? So this could be part of your, your toolkit. Having uh, matrices always helps us to get our ideas down on paper. So thinking about purpose, thinking about your true north, how do you drive awareness within your institutions around your purpose, your values of your organization? How do you develop the desire for people to get involved? What knowledge base are you developing? How do you give people the ability and agency and then how do you reinforce it? And the same with sustainability. Are people aware of the existential crisis that we're in, the Anthropocene? We are now in a new epoch of time. Do people have the desire to do something? And it's not binary, it's don't do anything or do everything. We can start to bring in the ideas of continuous improvement, respect for people, the elimination of waste into this. How do we give people the knowledge, the knowledge base and the ability to be able to act? And then how do we reinforce it? And with Lean, how do we develop awareness of Lean in our institutions, of the power and the benefits and the brilliantness of working in this way? How do we get people inspired to be involved? How do we again develop our knowledge base, the ability to do it, the reinforcement? And then coming back to storytelling, how do we start to develop all of our competences as storytellers? And then we can think about what is the current state and how are we gonna to move to the future state? So one of the organizations that has done this is, is Melbourne. And there is an organization called Regen Melbourne. And I talked to Willow, one of the amazing people who's involved in this. And what they have done is that they've taken the donut, which you can see on the right of your screen, which is where we are looking for the safe and just space for humanity. So we have our ecological ceiling, things like climate change, ocean acidification chemical pollution, freshwater withdrawals, land conversion and biodiversity loss. And then we have our community relationships. We have our social foundations. So all the things that we, we want to have as part of our communities. And then within the sweet spot, which is the donor, how do we develop this safe and just space for humanity? So one of the things that I'm, I'm working on at the moment is working with Winchester City Council on developing a Winchester donor but also thinking about how we can bring this into higher education as our work as lean pracademics. So what Regen Melbourne have focused on is, is how do they build up the knowledge base? How do they ensure that their place is full of life, that it's affordable for people to be there, that they're connected through their cultures, that they're collaborative and that they're enabled. And we could apply these models within higher education in our own institutions as lean practitioners. So this shows you the donut, which has been developed by an amazing lady called Kate Rayworth from Oxford University. She's an economist and she talks about the safe and just space of humanity, thinking about regenerative and distributive economies. So this is another template that you can add to your arsenal for this. So you can take this template and you can start to think about your own action, your team's action, your own institution's actions. So this is our toolkit. We have ADCAR, we have a storytelling template, we have different artifacts that we can bring together, we have rich pictures to help us to make sense of this and to tell your story. So over to you, what are you going to take away from this session? I'm going to give you one minute just to start typing into the meeting chat, what will you take away from this session? How are you going to add some of these tools to your own story making, to your own practice? How are you going to inspire your future leaders with your students, but also your future leaders that you're working with within your own institutions? And how can you inspire your current leaders? 
How are you inspiring yourself? How do you keep going? Because this work is quite tricky, is quite difficult. And one of the things I love about Lean HG as our community of practice is that sometimes it's therapy. Sometimes we, we need to download with each other. We need to share the challenges that we've got, the, the frustrations that we've got, <laughs> and also share the successes and the celebrations. So I'd just like you to take you back to this, what if? What if we had true equality? We valued ourselves, each other, and the planet in equal measure. What if we had an approach to business and lean that ensures we can thrive locally and globally? What if sustainability and lean in all of its forms is at the heart of the public and private debate? So get into your time machine. Wake up in the year 2030. How does it look? How does it feel? How are you flourishing as an individual, as a family, as a community, as a, as a university? So what should we stop doing? What should we keep? What should we start doing? So the future is ours and we have decisions to make. So thank you very much for joining this workshop. I hope you've enjoyed it, whether you're joining live or whether you're watching this um, later. Here are some great references that you can have a look at. And thanks for listening and participating. Thank you very much. <laughs>